a crown there. That is funny. Hey guys, that's funny. You've got the live shot there. We, uh, we, we thought we changed that thumbnail, but anyway, welcome to our live show. It is Tuesday, January something or other. <sighs> I think it's 2021 middle of another pandemic month. God help us all. Um, we are here tonight because we're going to be covering some information here, uh, dealing with pandemic renovations specifically. Okay. What we want to do tonight is just kind of cover all of the um, experiences that we had from last year in the various stages of lockdown, because everybody that watches the show is going to have a different experience with this. And we want to be able to have more of a discussion tonight about what you're going to be dealing with. So I've talked to some people on the inside of the industry and we got a good handle of what's going to be going on for supply chain this year. Um, and <laughs> let's just say, there's a lot of information that if we go over it tonight and quickly you have a reference, maybe it'll help you plan what you may or may not want to do this year because I don't think there, let me put it this way, there are some projects this year that you just don't want to do, period. Okay. Now, based on experience, where you live, what your your, your pandemic response is with your government, what kind of shutdowns you're dealing with, um, there's going to be some nuances here that, that you might have more freedom than some people, but we're all dealing with some uh, fundamental issues with supply chain. And so we're going to talk about a lot of that tonight and we're going to share experiences. So tonight we're going to have a little bit different. So rules of engagement for tonight. Ugh. It's cold where I live, guys. So I might even have a bit of a sniffle tonight since my medicine. Um, it's like what? Matthew, what's the temperature out there tonight? Right? Minus 18 or something? Bloody stupid. All right. I think the war the moon is warmer than we are right now. <clears throat> Here's the deal. Tonight, rule of engagement. Um, the chat is open to the entire planet. All right. So Sandy Rose is going to be busy. <laughs> Cheers, Sandy. Um, the, uh, the way I want to flow here is instead of having more of a presentation style, we're going to have like a living room conversation. All right. We're going to try this out. I'm going to give you some information. I'm going to ask for some feedback. So feel free to jump in the comment section with questions specifically related to what the heck we're talking about. And there's Mary in the chat. Good to see you again, Mary. And Roderick Westwood, another one of our members. It's good to see all the members in the chat tonight. That's awesome, guys. Thanks for supporting this. Now, if we get the feedback, we can share experiences. Maybe we can be better equipped, okay? Because this is the year that if you think the pandemic is almost over, you're going to be mistaken related to some projects and depending where you live. And you're going to run into all kinds of frustration. And there's nothing worse than starting a project that you can't finish because something external from your ability or your planning is holding you up. Um, so we're going to jump into this. I'm just going to say, how has the pandemic affected you? and your renovation experience in the last six to eight, 10 months. Throw in some comments. Let's let's hear from you guys. If you've been trying to do something, is it driving you crazy? Happy Australia Day. My goodness, I didn't know. I am so busy. Chris Sturt, thanks for informing me of that. I'm so busy, I didn't even know it was Australia Day. Now, to be honest with you, I'm not one of these guys that's on social media every day looking at every event and every calendar day and every ribbon, so please bear with me. If you don't see me do a social media post for something that's important to you, it's not that it, it's not important to me. It's just that social media is not that important to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm going, I'm drowning in trying to get this business going. Now, let's take a look at this. Um, now, so first of all, I'm going to just another rule of engagement. Okay. We are not a political channel. We are not a science channel. So the conversation tonight, I really like to keep it limited to the direct ramifications of the response to the crisis, not whether or not it's a real crisis, whether or not the governments are out to get us. Uh, we want to try to keep away from that conversation. I was talking to someone today and I don't care if, if it's a real crisis or not, if it's, if it's a real scientific issue or not, the reaction of, of the government and what they're doing and affecting all our supply chains, that's how it's affecting me as a renovator. And that's how we're going to have this conversation. And I'll tell you why. There are, depending on, on where you look, um, 8 million YouTubers who are there to tell you how to flip a house. 
right? Every 21-year-old kid who's ever bought a broken down piece of crap and renovated it has got a YouTube channel. And they're all out there telling you how to renovate and flip houses and become a millionaire. Um, and that's fine. No problem with that. There are a bazillion people out there. If you're a huge investor telling you how to manage your strategy this year because the stock market is taking a lot of investment because the, the Fed keeps printing money, you know, and, and there's so much money out there. There's new stocks joining the stock market every day because any business that wants capital can just become a stock and people will give you money for no reason. No one's checking out your business model. So it's a crazy world, right? But there is no voice in the wilderness to tell average homeowners like you what your plan should be this year, what, what the strategy for this year might want to look like. And so what I'm trying to do is say, hey, since there's 200 million of you that own a house and who aren't being talked to by the, the media, by any organization, they just assume that since you own a house, you're, you're the most brilliant people in the world and you don't need no help. And I think that's ridiculous because there's a lot of information out there that I think you need. So I'm going to share it tonight. Hey, what should you be renovating this year? What are you going to potentially run into problems with because of supply chain? What are you going to run into problems with because of um, uh, rules and the, and, and the way the government is reacting to the situation? Okay. What are you going to run into in, in response to if you need to hire people, what's going on in the marketplace? And we're going to try to cover all of that tonight. Living room conversation. Let's get into the chat. Maddie, do we got any uh, interesting stories here? Talk to me. No, you have to bear with me. We we just had dinner six and a half seconds ago. Matthew is still busy trying to scarf down his burger, I'm sure. Uh, cheers. That's a shout out to, who was, we, where did we get that chicken sandwich tonight, Matt? Was that Milestones? Yeah. So shout out, shout out to Milestones. That was a really good chicken sandwich, guys. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's talk first cost, right? I'm seeing a lot of this, right? Costs. <clears throat> Let's just talk about the cost for a second and so you understand why. The, there's two major factors going into cost, all right? One is, um, let's talk lumber, because that was most obvious. We all saw that happen this year, especially if you wanted to build a deck, right? Or if you're planning on renovating a basement and you're like, why are my two by fours costing me $10 a stick? Here's what happens. During the summer, the crews go out there and they cut down trees. During the winter, the crews go into the factory and they make pressure treated lumber. And when they're done making the contracted amount of lumber that's been asked for by the supply chain, then they, they finish that project and then they go back out to cutting trees in the spring. They don't go back into that factory until the next winter. All right. There's only so much pressure treated lumber available on the marketplace. Nobody's cranking it out every weekend. That factory is closed during the summer. So, what happens is, is uh, stores like the box stores, right? Because they do a lot of products. They got 150, 180,000 products on the shelf. They have what's called just-in-time delivery distribution system. So they have manufacturing plants all over the world. And they have a contract for that plant to distribute so much of that product to arrive on a ship at a port every so many days with so many containers of that product. And then from there, it gets distributed all over the country. So that every day somebody can take a box from the back room that came off a truck an hour later, an hour ago, sorry, unpack it and stick it on the shelf and keep the shelves full. It's called just-in-time delivery. The world is really running that way all over. 30, 40 years ago, we had warehousing. Okay, We had just as much sitting in a box with a roof down the street from the box store as what was in the box store. Now we got rid of warehousing. It's expensive and it drove up the cost. So they got rid of warehousing and kept the cost the same. They didn't give you a break, by the way. So whenever there's a, a, a unique supply issue, they just don't have the inventory. And as soon as that happens, it's like cha-ching. It's an excuse to raise the price. This is what happens. Well, if we don't have two by fours, you don't have two by fours, and you don't have two by fours, well, let's just all charge 10 bucks a stick. And whoever really, really, really wants to build something will be paying that price. That's what happens. Welcome to the real world. So that's just one of the small little impacts that happened last year. Now, if you were going to build a basement, you needed 300 sticks of lumber. It was a big deal, right? Because like, that's a, that's a lot of cash. I'd rather not spend it either. Now, um, 
Matt, are we live? Are we up to date on the chat there? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, Ben's asking the question about metal versus wood. You know what? At the end of the day, you're going to find that metal might be cheaper than wood on occasion. I did a video. I showed you how to use it. If you're not crazy about the concept, all right, then, then do yourself a favor. Buy your wood in the wintertime. Right? <laughs> uh, if you buy your wood now for a spring project and put it in the basement and you just stack it nice and flat and keep it organized, it'll be just fine in a couple months from now. And you can avoid the spring rush. Okay? That's one tip. Now, Roderick just did a super chat. Oh, that's right. Guys, if you're not a member and you got something to say or you want to get my attention, then do a super chat. Um, that's going to be really effective tonight. Okay? So, Roderick, see, he's, he's saying that he's not trying to go gangbusters. Just moved in a few months ago, so he's only fixing broken things or addressing urgent problems until he's lived there at least a year. Great point. One year in a new house before you go crazy because you don't know the problems with the house yet. Go through four seasons. And uh, that's a great point. Good call. I, I, that's, I preach that all the time. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about some of the, 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 the challenges with the supply chain, and then I'll give you my list of products projects that I think you should be doing, okay? Because... There are a lot of really great opportunities this year to increase the value of your home, even in the midst of supply chain issues. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, first of all, factors that are going to affect you guys, right? Um, the shortage of trades. Now, I know this is a DIY channel, but not everybody is doing everything DIY. You're still subbing out a little bit here, a little bit there. I don't know what it's like where you live, but where we are, the government has still got a program and they're still paying people to stay on the couch and not go to work. So a lot of the smaller construction companies are having a hard time getting staff to do work. Which is why when you call around, you'll say, you'll get a lot of this, oh, we're not available for six months, right? Six months is a long time to wait for a contractor. So if you're planning on something this spring or summer, call around now. Get on that list. Because what he's basically saying is, it's me and another guy, and all the four guys that I usually hire are sitting at home. It's not that all of a sudden he's the most popular contractor in the world. It's the fact that there's not enough guys around to fulfill the contracts, so everybody is just booked solid. And six months is kind of like the contractor excuse. If you're really desperate and you're willing to, to pay me for six months from now, then I'll, then I'll follow up with a visit to the house and close that contract, because instead of $10,000, you are going to be willing to pay twelve or fifteen or eighteen or twenty. dollars Now... Ah, uh, Frederick Sigard has just joined their membership. Welcome to Money in the Bank, my friend. Um, speaking of membership, in case you weren't aware, I don't know how you could not be, but if you're just joining a live show for the first time, we do have a membership program. We have a fantastic forum where you guys can all jump in and interact and share experiences and that sort of thing. Ask questions. I jump in as well. Answer as many as I can. We also can't let the cat out of the bag. We also have somebody working full time for us, actively pursuing massive corporate contracts so that we can get you con contractor pricing and all kinds of products. Those announcements will be coming soon and I can't wait to do that for you. Um, I think it's going to be a really exciting. So we'll talk about that in another show a little later down the road, but for now, let's just jump back into this. Now we talked about supply chain broken issues. Um, wow. So Pamela's got a comment here, right? She's uh, bought a fixer upper house last year. She's working on giving the kitchen, bathroom, and basement a facelift. Also need to build a fence in the backyard. Right. So keep that in mind, Pamela. The fence might be tough to do. Just saying. The lumber might not be available. Might be super expensive. And if you have that many projects on your list, uh, maybe just make a list and go, you know what? Maybe the fence isn't quite that important. And if it is important to fence in your yard, maybe go look at chain link. Okay. The uh, supply chain for steel isn't going to be an issue. So you're good there. And that might be a really quick fix. But putting up wood might be a problem. Um, another thing that you're going to run into guys is uh, complex systems. Like she, Pamela mentioned uh, kitchens and bathrooms, right? When you think about all the things you buy to do a kitchen or a bathroom renovation, especially if it's custom, you, you end up with a list of about uh, 30 to 40 
different companies that are all manufacturing a product. Now, you might find that a kitchen and bathroom this year, if you have 30 or 40 companies, depending on where they're manufacturing, depending on what the governments in that state or region or country or part of the world are doing, you may or may not have access to that product. Remember last year? Jump in. If you've got an experience with a supply chain issue from last year, let me know, okay? But last year we did our deck. We did a huge video. Do you know what took me three months to get enough balusters for my railing? Home Depot was sold out. I went there every morning at six o'clock in the morning and scoured through the store. And every once in a while, I'd find one box that was returned by somebody who had more than they needed. And I was the first guy there in the morning and I scooped it up. It took me a couple of months to gather enough of that material where I could actually do most of my handrails. Uh, I ended up a little bit short, even in the midst of that, which was crazy, right? They had months of waiting. Last year was unique because Home Depot purchases a lot of their products from overseas and the Chinese manufacturing market. And in the midst of COVID, what happens, we had not only just government shutdown, but the, um, the economy in China has changed a lot. And the shipping costs for moving a container have doubled and tripled in a lot of cases. And so all of the pricing structures and all of the issues that people have with their whole supply chain were just totally turned up on their head. And, and, and the shippers were like, I can't leave the port until I pay the bill. So what are you going to do about a Home Depot? And somebody had to open their pocket. So there was a lot of confusion there last year in the midst of the pandemic regarding the supply chain. Hopefully that's calmed down. It looks like it is for now, but we just don't need that kind of pain anymore. <laughs> but complex systems, right? You got multiple governments involved. You got multiple companies, multiple manufacturers, multiple trades. Forget the fact that these trades got to be inspected. I mean, raise your hand. If last year you called for an inspection and the government agency said, no, we're not inspecting during COVID-19 and your project just sits there going, what do you mean you're not inspecting? What am I supposed to do? Just, just sit here with a half finished kitchen. Like that's insane, right? So you, you really better do your research now. <clears throat> yeah. Tell me about it. I mean, the, the, the gouging and the pricing in the market is really crazy. All right. So you got to be really careful. Really think through your whole process. Now, I'm going to go through a list of projects that you probably can do with satisfaction. And then some tips if you want to do major projects. So how you can be successful so that you don't have all that frustration, right? You don't uh, you don't end up just going postal, right? Because we're probably all on the edge of postal right now. <laughs> anyway. All right. I'm going to just check my comments here real quick. See if I anything interesting. Oh, so some, yeah. So Jake is saying he ordered cabinets. Took eight and a half weeks. Yeah, original delivery was three to four, right? And and that's common. And and most companies have enough brains. Yeah, uh, most companies have enough brains to over, under promise and over deliver, right? Because people don't get upset. So when they say uh, it'll be delivered in four weeks, usually what they mean is two. But then when it takes eight weeks, it's because they're frustrated at their end as well because when you order something from a company, that company is used to a certain response time. And the communication about the, the, the interruption has really been an issue. Nobody really had a clue what was going on. And if you call the store to find out, nobody was working in the bloody office to answer the phone. Right? I mean, it's taken a whole year just to get somewhat efficient. And it's maddening, right? So let's go into projects. So anything outside, guys. If you want to do a project this year, think outside. Um, except for decking and fencing, the wood is going to be an issue. Everybody wants to deck and a fence. So get at it early and get the material in your backyard before you start. Okay. Don't go to the store and get all your posts and drill your holes and set all your posts and then, and then go back to the store to get the rest of it. Or you'll be the guy on the road with all posts and no fence <laughs> because they'll just be out of wood. So don't let that happen to you. Don't be a victim. All right. Um, if you want to do decks, you'll find that the structural lumber uh, survived a lot more than the um, decking. So you can go with uh, pressure treated two by eights, two by tens, and then go with treks. You can use a composite material. Again, it's a higher price point, but if you're in that market and your house valuation supports that kind of investment, not a bad idea. All right. Um, anything painting. Great year for paint. 
You know why? Because paint is mostly water and we have not had a water shortage. So uh, generally speaking, paint is manufactured and warehoused. Even in the commercial stores, they got a ton. They got truckloads of this stuff, right? So you're okay. You can plan on painting. And with painting projects, you generally don't start your paint project until you have the paint anyway. So it works out well. So if you have a, a, a distribution issue with getting paint in your house, that's fine. A couple of weeks will go by. Oh, the paint's finally here. Then you can start. That's not so maddening, right? Because it's not hard to organize a paint project. It's a couple of tools. It's a couple of fillers, a couple of materials, and you're okay. <laughs> Pamela just had a fangirl moment. <laughs> That's funny, Matt. Uh, well, cheers. Listen, I uh, am learning too, right? Hopefully one of these days I'll be really good at this live chat stuff. But I am not a multitasker by nature. So reading my notes and sharing information, staring in the camera, talking to the mic, reading your comments, listening to Matt. Man, sometimes a man just needs a drink. Mm. All right. <clears throat> Right. So Randy wants to paint his uh, home's exterior. Randy, if it's uh, aluminum siding, you got to prep it and prime it. Uh, if it's brick, just go ahead and do it, dude. But there's a stain. We did a video on that. And I think you're going to see, um, we did a video last week. We actually posted a segment of our live show. We're going to be doing a lot of that. All right. So if you have a burning question, you think the whole world needs to know the answer, feel free to ask it. All right. And we'll be more than happy to do a segment and share that information real time, especially during the spring. We're going to try our best to get um, uh, answers to questions that are that are current out, out there to so help you guys out. So if you're running into issues or you, you find out, uh, like last year, for instance, okay, we were doing our deck. One of the reasons the, the balusters for my deck were such a problem, A, Home Depot had supply chain issues. China had uh, dock issues and shipping container issues. Um, and then the Canadian-American market, we were in the middle of an uh, aluminum trade war. So all the other suppliers not the box store, all the other guys were having issues. They couldn't get their hands on aluminum. So if traditionally, if, if, if I had a problem with Home Depot, I just go down the street to a fence guy and say, listen, hook me up with some aluminum spindles and let's uh, powder coat those suckers. I can put in a contract and get some made, but not this, not last year. It was really frustrating because uh, I, I know some workarounds, but that wasn't happening. There we go. Matt turned down the light, I think. How do I look? A little better? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Other projects you can do next year, tile projects. And here's why. When you go to the tile store, you're buying inventory on the floor. You're not special ordering. So it's really easy to keep the cement and the thin set and the grout supply chains alive and well. There's multiple companies providing those products. And in a lot of cases, they're produced in the same country that they're being sold, okay? Okay. So just because it's an Italian company selling mortar and grout doesn't mean that all of that product is coming from Italy. Usually there's a manufacturing plant in North America somewhere supplying North America. Make sense? All right. Um, RJ wants to know how do I get a blue rental shirt? <laughs> well, you got to start a YouTube channel. You got to contact a clothing guy and you got to have 40 of these things made. Um, one of these days, RJ, we'll, we'll get that sorted out. I don't know. Man, <laughs> I got so many things on my plate. Honestly, I think it'd be cool if we can put these shirts available for you, but it's really not high on my list right now. But well, hopefully, hopefully we'll have somebody that joins our company who can actually take care of merchandise and uh, we'll get those shirts going at one point this year. If anybody else really cares and you'd like to have a, like, let me know, right? Like every once in a while I'll get an RJ or somebody mentioned something about a blue shirt and I'm like, yay, I can sort all that out and sell three shirts. But like, if everybody in the world wants a blue shirt, then my God, I'm, who am I to stand in the way? Uh, yeah, Sandy wants a blue shirt. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Drinking the apple juice, right? Like, I don't know. Well, listen, I mean, you know, feel free. Keep on bugging me. Get in the comment section on the videos and say, uh, I want to get one of your blue shirts. And uh, well, the more it becomes an important issue, the higher up on the ladder it'll go. Um, and there we go. Now. Hmm. There you go. That's an interesting question. I was just reading on the super on the on the comments here. Um, somebody's saying they're they're doing a uh, they're looking for sound proofing advice. They're putting down engineered hardwood. They want to make sure their downstairs neighbor can't hear them. 
Oh, you know, here's the crazy thing, because there is a building code for neighbors. Most people, if they're not in a condominium complex, the majority of units in this world are not soundproof properly, okay? Hence the phrase affordable housing. Housing. Most people renovate and don't get permits or, or make a unit in a basement. They don't soundproof properly. So if you're stuck in a situation where it's like, it's unbearable, the people downstairs are always complaining, buy yourself a really high density underlay mat and then put that underneath your engineered flooring. That's all it is. It's impact noise that really travels down. And if they are not happy with the end result, then you tell them to tear their ceiling out and fix their ceiling because the insulation is supposed to be on their side. <laughs> all right. And that'll stop that conversation. They'll, they'll probably just learn how to turn on music and wear some sound canceling headphones. All right. Um, let's get on with the uh, pandemic projects list. I talked about tile. Tile is good because tile's in stock. Okay. Shouldn't be an issue. Flooring. Flooring is going to be one of these issues, guys. Uh, careful when you're doing flooring. Because what should be in stock isn't always in stock. For instance, last year, Home Depot, life-proof flooring, not a bad product, right? I've told you this before. Um, they had massive inventory issues. Again, sourced out of China, shipping container issues, supply and demand. So before you do your demo, um, make sure you've got your product. Okay? Don't be stuck walking around on plywood for weeks and weeks and weeks waiting for the store to get your inventory in. Or you're going to be like me. You're going to be hanging out at Home Depot at 6 o'clock in the morning hoping to find one more box to finish a project. It'll drive you nuts. Um, next project. Oh, this is cool. I'm actually doing this. I'm going to make a video. Outdoor gym. Let me know in the comments real quick. Guys, what do you think about the idea of building your own outdoor gym? Okay. It's actually not that difficult. It's just a few sticks of lumber and a couple of um, powder-coated steel pipes. And you can have an outdoor gym that you don't need to have a membership. You can enjoy the outdoors. You can work out whenever the heck you feel like it. You can get up at 2 o'clock in the morning because you can't sleep, go outside, and, and knock off a few reps. You know what I mean? Um, I'm just saying. Uh, I've designed this thing in my head. I've had this template for a while. We didn't get to it last year. I'm kind of frustrated. But this spring, as soon as the ground gets close enough to thawed that I can turn on my jet engine heater and just point it at the ground and thaw that sucker out. We're going to put in an outdoor gym and I'm going to share it with you because I think it could be a really cool answer to a lot of problems, right? Like you can even work out in the winter time. If you put the right clothes on, it doesn't even matter. Right. But then most people who watch this channel don't live where the hell up in the North. Like I do like most of you have enough common sense to stay somewhat South. <laughs> so, uh, what if, about if you have five Home Depots to choose from? Well, then you're done because you can't be at all of them at six o'clock in the morning. Good luck with that. Um, next project you can do this year. If you have issues with water around your house, right? Like pay attention to this stuff. Um, make sure you got slope. Make sure you're moving water away from your building. And if you're stuck, great year for putting in a French drain because it's blood, sweat, and tears. You'll always be able to find yourself a little bit of weeping tile and some crushed stone. These are locally manufactured products, right? So no big deal. Landscaping outside. Last year with landscaping, we ran into supply issues, even for the concrete pavers. Think about it. It's just rocks and like sand, right? Made right there. They ran out of that stuff. There was such a huge demand for outdoor living last year. Even the concrete paver company were running out of inventory. So if you're going to do it, get started early, buy your product, own it. You might even have to have it delivered to your site. It's going to be a real common thread this year, getting everything delivered before you start. We used to be lazy and be able to just pick it up when we're ready to go to the next phase. This year, it'll be all about planning. Now, um, of course, decorating, remodeling, these are words you should learn to fall in love with this year, okay? Because it doesn't combine major systems. Whenever you're remodeling, you're not peeling everything open and starting over. You're painting cabinets, you're changing countertops, things like that, like a new faucet. How many of you would think that remodeling is better than renovating this year? It's a great question. I'd love to know 
if re, you'd, you'd be more into remodeling or renovating. Because renovating, remember, it's opening walls, changing systems, mechanical, plumbing, electrical, re, moving things around. This year, I'm going to really advise for a lot of DIYers, stick to remodeling projects. If you've got a major renovation project, just sit on it for one year. It's not going to kill you. Trust me. All right. Worst things have happened to humanity than waiting a year to do a renovation. I know it's kind of counterproductive for a renovation channel to tell people not to renovate, but I just think it's really good advice this year. Okay. So maybe take it. Uh, we got a super chat here from Mrs. Laszlo. Wow. I don't even know if I said that right. Thanks for all your help. There is a Canadian online company, Teespring, that allows you to design, then prints and ships t-shirts, mugs, etc. for you. Yes, it is true. And we did try that. What was it? Two years ago, Matt, we tried that? Yeah, yeah we shipped them and uh, three out of four arrived and two of them had the print wrong. And I'm not going to get in bed with a company that can't get their head out of you know where and do the product right. So um, I just had not enough confidence to take money from you to then deliver a product because Teespring you pay first. So we just moved away from that. We thought we'd wait. Uh, and Herman Azreus, maybe? I don't know. Uh, this is not a question, but more of an appreciation for Jeff. Aw. Get a lot of compliments on my new second story deck. <laughs> That's cool, buddy. Um, many thanks for the tips and tricks for advising me to pull a permit. Right? Because when you go to sell that house, you're going to have money in the bank. And if you have a party and there's a bunch of people out there, it's not going to collapse and no one's going to die, which is super important. Like, don't forget that. We have decks to have fun on. It's kind of important to make sure it's built right. Having an extra set of eyes on something is worth, it's invaluable, right? And the local building inspector is not the jerk in the room. They are just there to make sure that you're not screwing up and putting people's lives in danger. So feel free to pull a permit. It's not that painful. And we're going to actually do a permit video this year. We decided we're going to pull a permit and we're going to talk to the building officers and go through the whole process um, so that you guys have a better understanding. So it's not so scary because honestly, dealing with the city sometimes can be absolutely terrifying. Oh, here's a, here's a good comment. Refinishing furniture might also be good this year. Yeah. Like repolstering, you know, I'm, I'm not that good with a staple gun, but you know, uh, guys, Great. If, you, if you're crafty, again, that kind of moves into remodeling. I love this kind of concept. Uh, Mirza, wow, huge super chat. Just saying thank you, Jeff and Max. Open a Bitcoin wallet so you can accept tips and digital gold. <laughs> right? Ah, well, that's just something else to look at. I think before we go to Bitcoin, we're going to have to get ourselves some blue shirts on the market. Let's see who we got in the chat here for members. Shay is in the membership chat tonight. By the way, Shay, you're a new member. We've uh, we've seen a lot of you in the chat. Thank you for supporting us and being so active in the community. That's awesome. Uh, Sandy Rose, of course, is in the chat tonight. Big surprise. Hmm? Yeah. It started storming where you are, eh, Sandy? We're getting snow tonight. How about you guys? Like a lot. We don't have enough yet, apparently. Hmm. You're doing electrical upgrade this year. Now, let's speak about electrical. Larry? Electrical. My last year with electrical was a nightmare. Couldn't get my electrician to come because every one of his jobs, there was a product missing. There was uh, a supply chain for another trade. Everything was starting to stagger and they were tripping over each other. Nobody was finishing nothing. His timeline was a mess. He was pulling out his hair. We even had a problem with the hot tub. We couldn't get it plugged in because we couldn't get the... Um, uh, the, the there's a, a special box with a shut off like emergency panel that has to go on the side of the wall. They were out of stock in Canada. We couldn't get them. Absolute nightmare. Like drove us bloody nuts. And then when we finally got things put together, the inspectors wouldn't come to the house. Again, it's funny. You know, we got, uh, we got called back from Florida last year because for the first time, my wife and I spent a few weeks in Florida. It was lovely. Cheers to Florida. We come back for COVID. Oh, we got to come home. Oh, the world's the sky is falling. And uh, the week we got back, we got notified by the electrical safety people that we had to extend our building permit for the electrical. I'm like, yeah, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, I'm not done yet. A few weeks later, I call up and said, hey, I'm ready for inspection. And they're like, oh, we're not doing inspections. So they were, they were fine with taking my money. But they, they just weren't really quite in the mood to put on a mask and come and take a peek at my wiring. So be careful. 
you know, the, the more you do this year, the more you might run into problems. Ah, uh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Listen, uh, major landscaping, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's my list. There we go. Pretty much done. Is there anything else I need to talk about, Matt? Did I miss anything? All right. So here's it. The nuts and bolts. Kitchens and bathrooms, all right? Um, before we go any further, and I'm going to talk to uh, answer the question here from G Sierra. I want to just say this, guys. If you're going to renovate this year, you you really need to do two things. Okay, this is the advice. This is the this is the take out your pencil and write this down. This is money in the bank, right? Number one, you want to. Okay, three things. My brain just adjusted. I I can count to three. You want to scale down your ambition. All right. If you are successful with re reducing your ambition for the year and you get things finished and there's time and things are smoothing out at the end of the year and you want to stick another project on, then add to your year. But don't start the year thinking I've got three major projects. I'm going to nail them all. You're going to lose a lot of sleep and have a lot of stress. Okay. And you're going to end up kicking your dog. It's not necessary. Just take a breath, reduce your ambition this year, adjust your expectations and let's just take it easy. Let's let's be successful and stress-free because I think everybody's stress level is at like up here. So don't add more stress to your year, right? Dial back a little bit. Make simple projects. Stick to remodeling. Stick to things early. And if you're going to do things that are potential risky with supply chain, make sure you've got a staging area. And by that, I mean a garage or a shed or a basement or a spare room or you and your wife both agree – you know, we're going to turn the dining room into a material zone, okay? Put down floor protection, store everything, put a list together of everything you need, okay? Order it all. And then once it's all arrived and inspected, checked off the list, then start your project, okay? It's completely bass backwards to the way that we usually renovate because we're so used to having access to everything. But this is more the way things are done in remote areas, okay? It's all about planning this year. If you plan and you you have everything in your hands before you start, you'll be successful. You know, I've always preached, you should have um, your major components, all your purchasing decisions. But this year you need not just that, but your building materials as well, okay? Watch the trends, watch the news, pay attention to when things are gonna be open and close. And, and if there's going to be changes with inspections and processes like that, maybe stick to remodeling so you don't need a permit. That's money in the bank. All right, let's jump in. We got a couple of uh, couple of super chats here to get along to. Danielle G86. Oh boy, Daniel. Is that yeah? Because it's like not an e after the l. So Daniel, cheers, buddy. Let's get to the question. How should I insulate a 120-year-old house without slowly rotting the wood siding? I've got two by four studs. Concerned that insulation will trap moisture in the walls and build up over time in San Francisco. San Francisco. Okay, so you got a ton of sun, you got a ton of heat. Your vapor barrier is supposed to be on the outside of your house, but you got wood siding. So you're Essentially, yeah. Wow. So here's what you got to do, my friend. Um, the best advice I can give you, <laughs> I'm trying to watch the chat right now and I'm going blind. Matt's skipping her all over the place. Um, before I get into the advice on that question, Matt, wasn't there somebody I was going to answer a question for? Oh, dude, I am totally. No, 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 no. Okay. Before that, there was just a, like a like a regular member or something had highlighted. Oh, oh there. Okay, kid, don't move. <laughs> All right. If you've got a house and you're in the southern states and you got lots of sun, you got wood siding on the outside and it's a century home and you have no insulation, your issue here is going to be dealing with trying to keep it cool, right? So you're not heating, obviously. Now, when you add air conditioning, now you've got a thermal issue where the cold and the hot are mixing. And right there is where your problem is going to be. Okay, so if you don't want to have that problem, you've got to eliminate the ability for the moisture from the outside to condense with the cold air from the inside. Adding the insulation is a 95% of that solution, 
But having a vapor barrier on the exterior of the installation really is your solution. So what I've seen a lot of guys do is they will empty out the well cavity and then they will wrap plastic down the stud, across the stud bay, over the stud and back in and across the stud bay. And then they fill in their insulation. Seems like a hell of a lot of work. If there's a better way to do it, somebody needs to tell me. But generally speaking, if you're gonna to try to save the siding on that house, that's the kind of problem you're gonna run into. Okay, you're really trying to combine modern day cooling and heating technology with, with, with a century old building technique that didn't have air conditioning. That building does not have a problem if you don't add air conditioning. That building generally won't have a problem if you add air conditioning and don't insulate. But as soon as you wanna have your cake, eat it too, and it has to be delicious, watch out because you're buying, combining too many technologies over too many years and they're not all gonna fit together very well. Um, so GC area, here we go. Thanks for the deck info, Jeff. It's gonna be hard for me to mine materials from my deck this year, but I won't quit. It's the only way to have fun at home this summer, right? Now, this is the other side of it. If you're gonna, if you're stuck and you can't leave and you want a deck or an outdoor living space, consider the idea of an outdoor patio. Having an outdoor dining area might be the way to go. Now, I know a lot of people are going to buy two by two um, concrete form, like like blocks, right? The, the, the two inch thick, two by two foot. If you put down a bunch of uh, stone dust or limestone screenings and you drop those on and you use a rubber hammer and you tamp it all in, you can make a decent enough space to put a table and chairs on and have an outdoor sitting area where you're not in the dirt. Then... Next year when things are normaler, <laughs> more normaler, you can go ahead and remove your sod from the back of the house to the front of the house and then use those same pavers as the walkway. Remove them, reinstall them somewhere else and then put in the deck in a normal year. It's just a thought, right? But consider hardscaping. It's not as hard as you think. Can I just say that? Hardscaping is not as hard as you think? That's almost funny. Matt, am I the only guy laughing? <laughs> okay yeah spray foam insulation should work too good point kevin you know sometimes my brain just isn't as effective as it should be um if you use a, a combination what we call flash and bat where you add spray foam on the outside of your old wooden house before you insulate it and it's a closed cell it acts as a vapor barrier and so you can create like a one inch spray foam and then put all your bat insulation in it's a hell of a lot cheaper than filling the whole cavity and that should work. Good point. My God, what happened to you tonight, Jeff? Shoot, you're way behind. All right. Uh, Matt's got a question from, <laughs> you know, one of these days, people are going to use actual English to have avatars. Matt Cray's text. Easiest way to make a walk-in curbless heated shower. Um, not adding too much height at the door. Does the whole room need to be sloped to the drain? No. The easiest way is to have a shower that is as wide as the door, okay? And you put the drain at the door. I'll use a linear drain. Because the money you spend on a linear drain is the same money you'd spend if you added all the materials to raise the rest of the room. So you break even. And then you put in a slope pan for the shower going from the drain to the back of the shower. And that's the only part of the room you gotta slope. Because the water can't possibly leave the bathroom shower area because you have a linear drain going wall to wall. That is the easiest way to do it. We did a video on that not too long ago. It's about the custom bathroom. And if you put in the search engine on our homepage, guys, you can check out all these different topics, okay? So if you go to the YouTube homepage, go to the little icon for the search, you know, magnifying glass thing. You can put in any subject you want. It'll populate a list of videos and you can do research there, okay? That's a great way to use it. You don't have to just sit around and wait for YouTube to suggest a video for you. You can be proactive and go research yourself. Um, and that's a great way to go and do that. Now, we have a brand new member to the membership plan, Nick Holacek, I'm guessing. And Alex Gautier. See, figure that, I can get the French fine. That's because I know a lot of French folk around here, so I'm, I'm learning. Um, that's cool, welcome to uh, Money in the Bank. Cheers, man. Uh, David's got a question, and he's a member, cool. Um, yeah, that's not a question. That's actually David commenting on the other question from the guy from, was it San Diego or San Francisco? I think it was San Francisco because I was singing that song. All right. 
<laughs> what what is that comment matt was that you or was that was that michelle what's up hoser that's for everybody who's 50 and older who understands what that means cheers hosers mm. wow how many people put your comment in the uh the section there if you remember who bob and doug mckenzie are I almost am not representing very well tonight because I'm not wearing a toque. All right. Um, Frederick Sigard. He's got a super chat here. He's got a question. Is DIYing a new French train something that is possible? Exterior versus interior. Okay. So exterior French trains are really easy. You're literally just digging a channel and then putting in weeping tile and covering it in clean stone. That's not bad. Interior is the same process, except you're digging through concrete. And you're not using weeping tile. You're using a, a an actual, um, uh, it's a perforated pipe that has a uh, waterproofing wrap that goes over the pipe and then up the wall. And that is designed for any water infiltration in the wall system whatsoever to get diverted to a pipe. And that goes to a sump pit and gets ejected out of the house. Both of them can be DIY. The secret is with the interior one, getting your hands on those products and stuff because most of those products are marketed only to companies that do that for a living. So it's really hard to find the supply line. And I'm working on that. Don't have it yet, but hopefully one of these days we'll be able to put something together for us for homeowners who can do it themselves. Because honestly, um, like I say, most of these crews that they bring in to do concrete work and landscaping work, uh, we're, we're, we're not full of Mensa candidates, right? These are just Guys who are looking for a job who are willing to use their muscles, blood, sweat, and tears. And if you're into using blood, sweat, and tears to do a project to your house to save a ton of money, then you should be able to do that too. Because Lord knows if you don't have the right equipment, you can always rent it. Um, Sandy, you don't get it because you're not Canadian. <laughs> Bob and Doug McKenzie, for those who don't know. Oh, okay. There we go. So there's a couple people here who know. Bob and Doug McKenzie are... Um, Wow, where are we going to go? How far back are we going to go? 70s? 1970s? It's Rick Moranis. And it's, uh, oh, don't tell me. I'm going to embarrass myself here now. Oh, boy, this is not good. You remember from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, that guy? Him and a comedy partner that used to have a show, eh? And they wore toques. And they drank beer, eh? And they were Canadian, eh? And uh, it was about as funny as it gets right there. Uh, if you want to know who they are, just Google... Uh, Bob and Doug McKenzie, 12, 12, uh, what was it, 12 Days of Christmas? They did that song? Yeah. And then you can have a good laugh. Um, I suggest doing it after a couple beers because it's even funnier then. Uh, another super chat. I have a drop-in bath and tub in a cast iron tub. Got it. A drop-in cast iron bathtub with vinyl surround, which is pulling off the wall. Is it worth it to upgrade the tub or just glue it? A drop in. I'm wondering if maybe you've got one of those um, drop in glue in kits, right? Like you pay five grand, they do a bathroom in a day kind of combos. Um, if it's peeling off the wall, it probably relates to the fact that the wall doesn't have enough structural integrity to hold it together anymore. So maybe have a good look at it. If you're not sure if you want to peel the bathroom part to find out, Usually in a bathroom with a drop-in tub, there's at least one wall that's a part of the house, like an interior wall. And you can always cut the drywall on the other side of that wall and inspect the condition of the wall from the other side because that's just a drywall repair. And inspections can save you a lot of aggravation because if you know what's wrong before you make a change, then you'll know how to fix it. And it, sometimes it's just a matter of resealing things, right? And sometimes it's a matter of Mold is rotten away the wall and there's nothing left to hold anything together. So I would suggest an inspection. I've never seen an alcove tub, a drop-in, that doesn't have at least one interior wall where you can find out what's going on with the shower walls. Okay, so make sure you inspect it. Um, it's a patch and it's a paint to fix the inspection, but it could save you a lot of time and energy because if you start peeling that apart, especially this year, you might be surprised you can't get the products you want to fix the problem in a timely manner and you're without a bathroom. So... Be careful. Be careful out there, kids. Okay, Matt, let's get live in the chat. I feel like we're behind. Oh, Joe has, <laughs> he's doing such a good job of keeping me honest here. Joe, you got a super chat? I appreciate that. Want to turn a basement window into a door. 
What should I be aware of? Um, doors are usually a lot taller. Oh, it's block basement wall. Okay, so block basement, here's the rule for a structure with a block basement wall. Um, the width of the window should be the width of your door. And as long as that is wide enough to be code compliant, you can cut those that, that side of that window. You can cut it all the way to your foundation and remove it all. And you're not affecting anything structural, okay? Because every part of the block wall just to the side of that cut becomes a point load. And there's already a header above the window carrying the load. Now, I say that loosely because I'm assuming that the window was installed correctly. So, as long as that's the case, and there is a, uh, a steel lintel, okay, um, on the outside of the house where the window is to transfer any of the floor joist package load to the side, all right, you're fine. So, don't worry about it. Not a big deal. You can bust a hole anywhere where there's a window and put in a door. Uh, and, and that's pretty quick and simple. You can just use a quick cut. You can rent that saw at a lot of tool places. Just draw a line and cut straight down. Knock that sucker out. You'll, be, you, you'll love it. It's, it's a fun project. All right. Marilyn would like to know, what is the name again of the sink company you used in your farmhouse renovation? Oh, let's have a thought. Okay. I remember. <laughs> the company is called Stylish. Bum, bum, bum. And as a thought, if you have questions about the products and, and all that sort of stuff, guys, you can always check out the YouTube channel homepage. Go to the magnifying glass. Find the video. Go into the video description. All right? Go to the bottom of the screen. Click the show more. We got a ton of information in there. YouTube loves to give information. So in there is like links to our other channels, links to other videos of similar nature that have other information, links to the products and the tools and all that information. And if it's not there, then you can ask a question in the comments section while you're down there, and we will smarten up and get around to putting that information out there for you. Now, next super chat. Or are we at Trevor? Trevor has a question. Trevor's a member, and he's got a question. Jeff, do you have any tips or tricks on how to be more productive? How to not get distracted or stuck at a difficult spot in a reno? Thanks for everything you do. Hmm. Okay, productivity, eh? All right, let's see. Um, and I want to answer Kyle's question too there, just above it, Matt. Can you highlight that for me so I don't get lost? Thanks. Um, so productivity tips. Yeah, here's some tips. And, and some of these are going to be really dumb, all right? Eat a really light lunch. Because whenever you eat too much food, the blood leaves your brain to go to your stomach to digest it. And as soon as your brain is without blood, you're stupid and you're slow. And you think you're moving fast, but you're moving half speed. That affects your productivity. Eat just enough to shut your stomach up so it's not barking and complaining, and then you'll be productive, okay? Uh, I've always enjoyed having a really small lunch and then a great big dinner and then a couch moment. That's kind of how I like to end my day. Um, as far as not getting distracted, turn your phone off, all right? Pretend it's 1980 and we don't have phones. Back when we used to work for a living and we used to get eight hours of work done in a seven-hour day because we were that effective, right? There was never any distractions back then. So turn off your notifications. Turn off your phone. Shut that thing up. It's uh, just irritating. Um, one other thing, Tim, how many more productivity? Okay. Another pro productivity tip is this. Set yourself a goal for production for the day, and then don't stop work until you hit it. Two things will happen there. One, it'll become 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and you'll still be sweeping up, but that's fine because you hit your goal. Two, you'll learn how to set better goals. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then you'll feel more productive, right? Once you know how much work you can actually get done in a day, it'll affect how much you set a goal for the day. And then you'll be like, okay, so now I'm productive because I actually reached a goal. Reaching the goal makes you productive. Setting a goal too far out makes you feel like you're never being productive. So it's a bit of a mind game. All right. Um, Matt Krasek, Schluter said that foam pans are not good in point load. That's a good point. Schluter wants their pans installed on a subfloor base. 16 inch on center, minimum two by 10 um, dimensional lumber framing. So as long as you've got that in place, you can put in the Schluter with the drain at the door of the shower mat, and then you can slope it away. If you're really trying to keep things thin and tight, you can actually, um, how do I do this? Let's pretend this is your two by 10, okay? 
you install your two by four, right? Three quarters of an inch from the top of that two by 10. And you laminate it, glue it, construction glue and screws on every joist floor, floor joist cavity on both sides. Then you cut three quarter inch plywood and you stall inside between the floor joists on those two by fours. Again, glue and screw. And you create a solid base that you can put your Schluter pan on at the same height as your actual sub, I'm sorry, your, your floor joist height. Then on the other side of your drain, you're gonna find that just having your OSB is, is more than enough. You have more than enough room in that environment to go with a standard tile floor installation with a floor drain and then sloping it back up, okay? I know that's a lot of information. In the new year, we're gonna be doing a couple more videos about all that kind of information. So if you're stuck, consider joining the membership program at, um, you can send me pictures of your project and I can actually uh, take some time to lay out a proper strategy for you to get the look that you're going for. Because whenever you're doing a renovation that's design based or it's based on a style or a look, you, you've, you've got options, but it takes a certain amount of experience to pull that off. And you don't want to be disappointed with the outcome a year or two later. So, you know, uh, take advantage of all the years that I screwed up. <laughs> so I've learned better. And then I can share that with you. All right, cheers. Um, Christopher Hones, uh, super chat here. If already in a supply chain issue, hmm. right? If you're considering painting subfloor as a temp solution, product for decent durable finish for a year before covering. Wow. Yeah. If you're going to paint your subfloor, go ahead. As long as whatever floor you're putting over top of that is a floating floor or a nail down floor. But if you're painting and then you're using an adhesive, you could run into issues. So make sure you've got the solution before you paint. So if you're going to paint your subfloor and you want to use an adhesive for a hardwood, let's say, then make sure that you've talk to the hardwood company, picked out an adhesive and a primer to go on the paint that'll all work together, that they're happy with your assembly, okay? So don't just jump in and say, oh, I'm gonna put some paint on this thing. You could run into some issues. Um, and you might find that uh, uh, oil or water base might be a, a, a real key component there. All right, I'm just saying, know the end from the beginning. It's very good key. All right, let's get back to Kyle's question here. Um, do you suggest putting quarter inch plywood down before LVP or just try to fill in any dents and dings in the subfloor? Wow, great question. First of all, there's two kinds of luxury vinyl plank out there. Luxury vinyl plank and crappy luxury vinyl plank. <laughs> if you have a stone plastic core, SPC, plastic plank, you are not going to be translating or, or, or the floor is not going to be following the, the grooves and the gaps in the floor, okay? It'll, it'll move your weight and translate that for you without drawing the picture. Um, here's the thing, and yeah, Matt, I get it. I'm gonna try to keep my answer short. That's cool, but at the same time, gotta give an actual answer to an actual question. <laughs> I'll do what I can. So, luxury vinyl plank, stone plastic core, you're gonna be good to go. You don't need the quarter inch plywood. I know I did a video where you saw me do that. Um, the quarter inch plywood was because I had numerous issues in that house. I had some, um, some, some, uh, some wood floor that was glued down. I had some stonework that was in one place. I had some carpet in another place. And the subfloor system was such a mess. It was easier just to start with a brand new floor. And so I just quickly put down a quarter inch over everything just to get a new surface so that I could have a good installation. Because that particular flooring had a cork backing, I wasn't using an underlay, and there was just really no way to be able to trust the cork to do the entire job. That's why I did it. My rule is on flooring, if the hole isn't bigger than one by one inch, you can just go right over top of that. You don't need to invest all that money and, and time in doing a plywood subfloor in order to do a floating floor, okay? Most layers of subfloor are related to providing enough structure for that new flooring to perform. But floating floors, if you're buying a quality SPC luxury vinyl, you won't have any issue. Get at least five mils, okay? And you'll be fine. SPC core, five mil luxury vinyl. You don't have to spend all your time and money doing that. All right, cheers. Um, uh, Yvonne Kasten. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of name. I'm going to not even try. We're going to call you Yvonne, all right, for short. Best way to isolate... Trust 
for wood decking over concrete balcony. Extended as a patio. Membrane like a basement or flank. Okay, you're, you're looking for a solution to a problem. So you've obviously got a concrete balcony and you want to do wood decking over that concrete balcony, but you want to have some sort of framework and then you want to extend it past the concrete balcony. So you got two choices, all right? Choice number one is use two by six as a floor joist. A lot of concrete balconies had for at least the six or seven or eight inches up to the door height you can play with the last step into the house. So if you go with two by six, that two by six is thick enough that you can go past the concrete another five feet as an extension before you have to add a support post, okay? And that's an option. The other option is you can go with the two by six, or sorry, you can you can go with a, a two by eight or two by 10 floor joist, and you can you can cut the dimension of your patio and 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 just leave the last inch and a half, okay? And then have it go down and put a joist hanger on the concrete patio with Tapcon screws and to carry the load here, and then you can run it out another 10 feet or so. That's another option. But with all these kind of ideas, if you're going to do that, you're really moving into structural load, and you've got to have a design and a permit. So, yeah, there's options. You probably had never thought about the idea of using a joist hanger off the end of your concrete and then just kind of cut it to just get an inch or two. And if you put down a dimpled membrane, that'll make sure that when it rains, everything dries. The water will have somewhere to run. So that's a really good idea. Okay, so cheers to that. Um, Thomas Preston, welcome to Money in the Bank. Cheers, Thomas. All right, awesome. And, and James Headley, another member joined tonight. That's cool. Very cool. Welcome, James. Uh, let's get into the questions here. Michael Regan, how do I insulate a, the 2 by 4 rafters? They're exposed painted rafters for best results. Um, okay. Wow. Uh, how do you expose, how do you insulate a two by four rafter? Exposed painted rafter look for best results. Yeah. You know, Michael, a lot of that comes down to where you live. Like insulation is really something that's um, location specific. So if you're in the North and you have two by four rafter, you don't have enough rafter to insulate properly. But if you're in the south, the two by four rafter, you can probably spray foam that and get enough insulation that it'll be effective for you. Um, dude, man, that's one of those questions. If you join the membership program, you can send me pictures of your house, tell me where you live, the age of the home, what's going on. You know, like sometimes these questions just aren't that simple, right? So uh, I would suggest take a look at joining the membership program, okay? Even if it's just for the one month, to get your answers, you can send me pictures. I'm, I'm happy to help, all right? So cheers. Uh, you, you don't have to commit to like a lifelong membership. Uh, there's no wedding ring attached, okay? Um, it's all good. Um, Alex Gauthier, member, seems like my super chat from before was lost, so I'll repost. Yeah, that happens. Would you recommend Schluter's system for a first-timer when it comes to a basement shower? Currently has a dry pack pan above grade. I don't see why not. To be honest with you, the technology for building a shower, if you're not installing a shower pan and you're doing any kind of custom work, I think Schluter is probably the most DIY friendly out there because as long as you respect the science and the technology and you install things properly, you're going to be successful, right? There's, there's no degree of artistic skill or, or um, prior experience necessary to perform those tasks. You just really got to read the information and install it properly. Um, Schluter is one of these companies where they're like, they've gone through a lot of different changes over the years with, they had a program, they had approved installers, they stopped doing that. They wanted to get more training. They didn't want to be responsible. Then they've got a great warranty, but only if you do it right. And then it only works. So like if you have a problem with your shower with Schluter and you say, I think there's a warranty concern here, come by and check it out. They're going to rip your bathroom apart. And they're going to show you where you screwed up. Well, and only if you didn't screw up, are they going to give you a warranty. And in the back of their mind, they already know if it failed, you made a mistake. So they're, they're never really there to find out what's wrong with their product because it works. So follow the rules. Don't cut corners. Um, you know, go, go 150% on your integrity and you'll be fine. 
Great product. Thomas has got a question. What to look for in a structural engineer? Okay. Our local codes require one to do drawings for adding another bathroom to a four bedroom, one bath house. I ah, wouldn't be surprised. So um, to, what to look for? Generally, the answer to what to look for in a structural engineer is um, just Google structural engineer near me. Find someone close and you've got your best price. Um, I know engineers, right? Ooh, we use the word engineer and all of a sudden it's like, you know, uh, you want Scotty from Star Trek to draw your bathroom. We don't all have to have engineers that are, are capable of putting a shuttle into space. All right. We're talking about structure. So there, it's, it's basic, simple math. There are rules and guidelines that they got to follow. And um, I would put structural engineer into the same category as a decent auto mechanic. Don't think that because they're called an engineer that their science is so overwhelming that it's a scary proposition. They're really just gonna come in. The word engineer means that they have the ability to put a red stamp on the drawing, okay? And what that means is that the city's not liable for what that guy says. He's liable on his own because he's got a stamp to put on the drawing. So if anything happens, it comes back on him. And, and that is just moving liability. So the structural engineers, their stamp is just to move liability from the city planning department where your permit is going to be filed and taking it off of their shoulders and putting it on his. That's all it is. It's not that big a deal. All right. Um, I, I can pretty much draw nine out of 10 projects that I do nowadays that a structural engineer is going to send me drawings. I already know exactly what they're going to send me. Gets a little redundant, <laughs> but until you've had enough experience to know how to do all this stuff and you've got to have a stamp for a permit, that's your only option. So just get one close because they're going to charge you by the hour. They're going to have a trip charge. And um, at the end of the day, yeah, that's about all I can say. D don't be afraid to read the reviews, you know, because in every profession, there are people that shouldn't be employed. And uh, you want to find out if uh, you're hiring a jerk. All right. Michelle Meyer, got a question here. I have a shower in the basement and was raised six inches. That's very common in order to facilitate the drain. Walls go to the ceiling. Okay. Should I do hardy board ceiling? Drywall is there now and has mold. So your issue with the mold and this drywall ceiling, one of two things, Michelle, A, either the ceiling is too low, so you only have a seven foot ceiling once you have that raised. And once you put a door or a curtain on there, there's not enough gap to let all of that steam leave. And so it condenses right there on the drywall and sits there like moisture droplets. If you have a shower and water sitting on your ceiling, you have a problem with your exhaust. You have a problem with your HVAC in that room. You need a fan, okay? You need to be pulling air so that the steam isn't sitting in that space. Consider installing your shower curtain lower. <laughs> have the fan on while you're using the shower. And if that doesn't work, then yes, pull out the drywall, add cement board, and then tile the ceiling because no amount of paint is going to solve that problem if you've got big water droplets up there. But if you tile it, at least then you can put tile and grout and the water condensing on the tile is not going to cause you a long-term problem. Cheers. All right. DESP, welcome to Money in the Bank. Cheers. And welcome to Carl Vink. My goodness. All right. Guys, this is exciting. I can't, I can't, I can't contain my, my joy. Uh, the membership program is growing. All right. Let's go see what we got here. Boom, boom, boom. Give me a question, Maddie. Talk to me. <laughs> That's a great comment. I'm going to share that. One second. Nathan Bowen. He says uh, his dad was a civil engineer for 45 years. And he said, all you really need to know is that uh, stuff runs downhill, right? That's brilliant. That's 90% of what people do. Make sure that water moves in the right direction and that uh, there's enough structure underneath something that if you stand on it, it doesn't snap in half. It's not a whole lot of math there. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a question. It is 10 after 7, and I think we are almost at the end of it. Uh, Kiana Wilson is a member. You know what? It's amazing how many members are in the comment section. Guys, if you're watching this and you're not a member, you're allowed to ask a question. Holy cow. Um, you know, Super Chat will guarantee you worried it, but... And don't forget to hit the like button real quick. Why don't we all just do that? I don't even have a like button here. Let's so smash the like button, as they say. All right. We'll make sure that the YouTube algorithm maybe gives us a little bit of respect. Um, because we're here helping people for free. Holy cow. How often do people do that? 
Tony is finishing a basement in Chicago, Illinois. Cheers. How would you insulate it? Okay, so he's he's got a, a potential assembly here. Let's go through it. He's got Tyvek between the foundation and the studs. Good. And then vapor barrier between the studs and the drywall. Correct. Two by four studs with R13 fiberglass insulation. That might not be sufficient. You might be running into a problem, Tony, with that assembly because in a lot of cases, uh, modern insulation code is the same insulation for the basement as on the main floor. Now, if your home is built out of two by fours on the main floor, that is R13. So you're fine. But if you've got a two by six construction and you can tell by measuring from the glass to the casing on your window, all right, if that is five and a half inches or five inches, that means you've got two by six frames. So then you're going to have to go to R20. So what you do is you take your frame of your wall and you pull it an extra inch off the wall and then you can stuff your R20 insulation in there and pass the code. It's not the best practice. The best practice is to put your uh, rigid foam insulation up against the outside wall and then your frame and then your R13. That gives you an R20. Um, but depending on the age of your home, you might want to have a one inch gap airspace there. So again, I don't have one answer fits all. If you need more help, consider joining the membership. Send me your question, send me a picture. But, or you can ask another question right here. Give me the age of your home, okay? And if it has exterior waterproofing membrane on the outside of the house, the black dimpled plastic sticking up out of the dirt. And if you give me that information, then I can follow up and we can solve that for you. Cheers. Okay, um, Nano Reaper. <laughs> Great name. Welcome to Money in the Bank. All right, cheers. And then Damien has a question. Do expensive furnace filters such as 2,000 plus allergens, et cetera, make the furnace work that much harder due to its density and is spending the money justified? That's really a personal question. I'll be honest with you. Um, if you have a furnace filter and you're buying a really high quality HEPA filter and you're having issues with when the furnace stops it, bam, and you hear that bam sound, that snapping sound, it's because there's too much pressure behind the filter for your cold air return. And then the, the, the whole planet is being sucked in while, while everything's going on. And then, and then it just pops back into position when the fan shuts off. If that's happening, you got too much filter for your system. But at the same time, if you've got sensitivities to things and you want to have your filters in place, that's one way to do it. The other thing you can do is you can put um, the filters right at the, uh, the register where it's coming into the room and not right at the furnace where all the work is being done, that might be another alternative. But generally, I would say that uh, fan filters aren't going to clog you up, but they will need to be changed more often, depending on the condition of the house and the kind of flooring you have. So if you've got carpets and you've got what, a high-density filter, you're going to be changing a lot more often. So it's not just five times the cost. It's twice or three times the replacement. So just pay attention to that banging sound in your furnace when you're turning off and on. And if you're getting it, check your filter. It's probably time for a change. Easy advice. All right. Um, hey, Bob. Good to hear from you, Bob, from Orlando. Now, in case you weren't aware, Bob was uh, one of the only people who ever made it out to one of our live events last year before we had to come home. And he's wanting to know if I got any experience with DC motor ceiling fans. I know you're a cool gadget guy. <laughs> what do you say? Oh, dude. <sighs> no. See, as soon as you use the word DC motor, you lost me. <laughs> I think that's the only time I've ever used a DC motor is when I had a little car in a racetrack with that little trigger. We'd stand there and watch them zip around in a circle. I think that was just to pacify young children. No, I have no idea what to do with that. Um, man, oh man. A, it's Tuesday. B, it's nighttime. I'm exhausted. And DC motor? Yeah. No. Uh, I think I think when it comes to fans... Um, it's really simple. When they stop working right, you throw them out and you get a new one. <laughs> Keep your life simple, man. <laughs> All right. Ahmed has a question here. He's a member. Hey, Jeff, I want to build a curbless shower in my basement with a linear drain. Great idea. How can I raise the rest of the bathroom floor to the highest point of the shower? Exactly. Don't. Put the drain at the door. It's that simple. And then you don't have to raise the rest of the bathroom floor. You just raise the shower from the drain to the back of the shower. And they sell that wedge for the floor use that and then be like mind blown redesign your shower if you have to right go three by five feet deep 
angle with a three foot door and three foot curbless shower. Um, if that's not doable, huh? Well, then you're stuck. You're going to have to raise it all up, right? Or if you're in a basement, and I'll, I, here's some great advice for a lot of people who are going to put a shower in the basement. If you have a basement, and a lot of times when they're putting the concrete in, they'll pour it, and they use that big helicopter thing to smooth the concrete. And the, they start in the middle, and they work towards the edge. And you'll see a little slope in the floor, right? Well, if you put your shower, if this is your outside wall, and you put the shower on the other side of the bathroom, a lot of times the whole bathroom will automatically slope to the shower anyway. So if you just tile it and put the drain up against the outside wall, boom, you've got a sloped floor. Huh? Think about it. Once I renovated an old house and we did that, they wanted a shower. And the second floor of the house, the house had a bit of a sag. So we just put the shower at the bottom of the sag, put the drain up against the outside wall. Didn't have to even use a pan. Everything naturally sloped towards it. <laughs> there are ways around anything. All right. Uh, I got a super chat here from Next Prime. Vapor barrier subfloor in the basement. Okay. Or no. Uh, 2017 built detached Ontario foundation with membrane. Basement, outer wall, framed and insulated and dry. Okay, so here's the real million dollar question. You've got a more modern construction house. You've got waterproofing system going on. That means you've got a vapor barrier underneath your concrete floor. So you don't have any kind of a problem with moisture entering into your basement. So the only reason you'd use a subfloor here is A, if you had a temperature issue, you're looking for uh, a thermal break at your floor, okay? So you don't necessarily go the dimpled membrane. You could use the insulated panels with the OSB, or you can use your own system. Um, you, so you could, could create a thermal break on your floor if you wanted to, if you got little critters running around. The way you can eliminate the need for a thermal break on your floor, however, is just to bring a couple of heat runs down on interior walls, design it that way so you're blowing air across the floor. All right, and then put your cold air return to the floor as well somewhere else in the basement, and that'll keep all of the heat moving around on the floor and it makes it quite comfortable. Now, since you don't need a subfloor, the only reason you might want to consider one is water events. Are you um, located near a hill? Do you have windows with window sills? And if it's a 2017 house, they're usually dug out. So you shouldn't have a problem with water getting in over the windowsill. Generally speaking, you're pretty good there, right? So water events aren't a major concern for you. Um, I would say, you know, if you don't have a thermal break, you know, necessity, unless you want to install hardwood in your basement and you need a thermal break and a vapor barrier in order to do that, you don't really need a subfloor. You could just go vinyl right on top of an under pad, right on your concrete. And you should be fine. All right, so cheers. Um, and we have uh, SS Laplace Transform has a question. <laughs> Jeff, is underlayment like rosin paper important for hardwood floor install? Yeah, kind of. Like, here's the deal. Um, there's two kinds of hardwood floor install. People who install hardwood floors over top of a, a conditioned airspace, like a finished basement with a heating and cooling system, or people that install hardwood floors over top of their crawl space, which is not a heated space, right? A lot of houses in North America have crawl spaces that don't have vapor barrier or heating and cooling systems. They just have fresh air blowing through, right? And that's fine. So if you have that environment, you want to put in a hardwood, you need a vapor barrier. And that rosin paper becomes the vapor barrier for your hardwood floor, okay? Very important system. If you have a heated condition space underneath, you don't need a paper, but by putting in a paper, it is easier to slide the wood around. So it's not totally necessary in every application, but a lot of pros use it all the time just because they're used to it. Um, there was an old saying in carpentry, don't ever um, install wood on wood for whatever that's worth, right? But they do it all the time anyway. So if you want to use paper, go ahead and use it. It'll never hurt but it doesn't always have a benefit that you think it does. All right, let's move on. Cheers. Yeah. Uh, oh my God. Shay is saying that there's close to 600 people in the live chat right now. Well, it's better that than sitting right here in my living room, huh? Can you imagine? <laughs> We'd get arrested, Matt, if we had that many people over. Hmm. And I'm not kidding, man. I feel like, uh, 
our government is moving one step closer where it's almost time to start, you know, considering having a, an exit strategy from the country. Oh, yeah, yeah. Makes me nervous. Um, yeah, so there's a great question. Any experience with redoing a dock in fresh water lake floating with concert, uh, concrete pilings uh, and just the wood decking? No, actually, and I'm going to be honest, I have no experience with docks. Um, we're going to change that. Not this year, but I think maybe next year we might just go have to buy ourselves a cool little vacation cabbage. Cottage cabin, cabbage. That's a cabbage, cottage or slash cabin. We got to grab one because um, a there's a lot of great projects we can do up there. And talk about scenery for a video, have on the lake behind you, right? How awesome would that be to film a, a video and have the loons out there doing their little noise? And no, I'm not going to do a loon call. All right, <laughs> but that'd be cool. I think there's a whole lot we can learn. Uh, Laura Conrad is a member. I want to know how do you feel about those recirculating pumps that give you hot water as soon as you turn on the faucet? Are they worth the money and energy use? Um, if you have a three-story home, definitely. Laura, you'll love it. End the discussion. All right. I have a, I had a plumber once, and he used to say the same thing. If you got a three-story home and you don't have a recirculating pump, um, a you're wasting time and money. You're irritating yourself, but. Why in the hell would you not install something that solves all of those problems and all those irritations, right? It's not about energy loss. You're actually saving money with a good circulation pump if you got a three-story house. With a two-story house, it all depends on location, you know, how far your water line's running. Like my daughter's house, if this is their floor plan, in the middle of the basement is where the, the on-demand hot water tank is. And you'd think if the bathroom is on the second floor up here, they'd have a line running up to it. But nope, it goes up across the floor, up the outside wall, all the way back across the... It's the stupidest thing. It's like a 90-foot run. Well, that's a lot of water they got to pump through there before the hot water shows up. Anyway, I don't know who built that house, but you guys really need to take a look at your interior design plans there because there's no sense having water lines running 90 feet to travel 12 feet. That's just stupid, right? Like, figure it out. All right. Um... Have I ever used sauna base for flooring soundproofing? Is it as good as sauna pan? Seems to require layer plywood over top using blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I, I would not be a big fan of using anything as for soundproofing on a floor that requires another layer of plywood over top. To me, that's insulating the wrong side of the floor. You know, if if the if the uh, if the under pad that's designed for impact noise isn't going to solve the problem then you've got to open the ceiling from underneath. And the discussion. I don't care what the situation is. That's the most cost-effective way to solve that problem. Everything else is just throwing money at a problem. And you know what? It's, it comes down to this. They'll sell it to you, and they'll be like, well, you're already doing the floor. The furniture's moved. You know, this is where you're working. This is your access point. Blah, blah, blah. Spend another few thousand dollars. Huh? And you're going to get an improvement of really small amount. Or you can open up drywall. It's just drywall. People, I mean, come on. How many videos got to do? Screws, mud, sand, paint, done. Tear it out. Insulate. Put in some other materials if you want to. But for God's sake, don't ever be intimidated to solve a problem by removing drywall because that is your lowest cost to do anything ever. Never had a project or a problem that I couldn't solve by removing drywall to solve it cheaper than any other option that was on the market. All right? My God, it's the stuff costs like nine cents a square foot. Who cares? Throw it out. <laughs> it was dust before. It's dust between paper. Doesn't hurt the environment to toss it away. Big deal. Moving on. I'm going to rant here. What the heck am I going to do? All right. Well, it's almost 730, guys. Um, I would love to get, let's open this up. I want to hear about what your project is that you're planning for this year. And if you've got questions about your project. Let's do some, some, and you know what? Let's talk about your supply chain. Where are you going to shop? So if you got a project you got coming up and you're like, I think I'm going to get all this stuff from here. Is there better options? Let's answer those questions for the next 30 minutes. Fire away. I'm going to tell you where your options are for going shopping to help you think outside of the box store. Okay. Dear God, we're going to film this video tomorrow and help you guys out because when there's supply chain issues, you need to know how to find your options. And I've got a ton of tricks up my sleeve for that. So we're going to make that video tomorrow and put it out real soon. 
Um, but if you've got questions about your project, I'm more than happy to help you out and solve your problem and save you a ton of money. And you know, when it comes to box stores, let's just be honest, you can get a lot more variety, higher quality product at a lower cost with better sales and service, people behind the desk who know what the product is and how to install it, how it works and what the benefits of other options in the store are. Why in the hell would you shop at a box store when you have all of that available right next door, right? We get just too programmed and too used to thinking that I only have one option when there is a lot of other options. Yep. Crown Royal Canadian, Canadian whiskey. Mixed with a lot of ginger ale. Okay. Like let, let's, I'm not tossing back like 12 ounces of that stuff or anything. My God. All right. No one mentioned box stores. Jeff's already ranting. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. All right. Uh, somebody wants to know about upcoming DeWalt deals. Yeah, we're working on it. We'll see what we can do. But if you want a good DeWalt deal, go down to the local pawn shop. Lots of great DeWalt tools being sold down there at a great price. That uh, probably only got a couple weeks of work. Uh, never be afraid of buying a DeWalt tool from a pawn shop. Still a DeWalt tool. It's always a good tool. Get a great deal. All right. Um, cabins for kitchen remodel. All right, so that obviously came in just after I asked about your project. You want to know about cabinets? Cabinets. All right. There are a ton of options for cabinets out there. One of the options you have is do yourself a favor, go to Ikea, get all the cabinet boxes, all right? Now, with all of the doors and drawers, you don't have to use Ikea. There's other options. There are companies out there that manufacture all the door plates, drawers. They, they do all of these um, different styles, different colors, because Ikea is really limited with their color and options. But there are companies out there that have just taken the roof off of the options. They got 100 colors, 40 styles, 29 kinds of wood looking. I mean, it doesn't even matter. If you can find it in a professional cabinet shop, you can find it on their website designed to be installed with Ikea cabinets and hardware. I'm telling you right now, it is definitely an option worth looking at. Um, okay. Yeah. Vega lights has been sold out for a while. Any other options? They have been sold out for a while, but my understanding is they just got a new shipment in. So feel free to keep checking on that. And again, that comes down to the same issues with supply chain. They're doing their best, right? Aren't we all? Um, it just comes down to, you know, uh, being persistent. I know next year, a lot of our supply chains and a lot of the options and deals that we have available for you guys are going to get smoother. It'll be nice. I appreciate your patience in the meantime. Um, Oleg has got a question here. How to build subfloor to tile over in a 1913 basement? You were thinking dry core, but afraid your tile will start cracking. Any recommendations? Yeah, 1913 basement. Wow. <sighs> 1913 basement is still concrete. What it doesn't have is drainage underneath the concrete. Okay? It's going to be dirt. What you need to understand about that is if you have water moving around in your subfloor underneath your concrete in a 1913 basement, depending on your location, you're going to get heaving. You're going to have movement. So before you consider tiling in that environment, you might want to take a look at um, first, what's the house drainage situation like? What, how much rain do you get? Do you get brainstorms like in California? They're getting 20 inches today. God help you all. Um, you really need to know what your house is dealing with because the concrete floor in that age of a house is on dirt. And if it gets saturated, it expands, the concrete moves. I don't care what you put on that, you're going to have issues. So make sure you put in a sump pump. All right. Yeah, we're good. Okay. <laughs> Matt was just checking the camera to see if we're recording this. I love it. He's like, yeah, we're good. We're good. I'm like, okay. Um, but yeah, 1913 basement. Understand your basement floor is not designed to be finished on top of. You know what? Sucks to hear that. Your best bet might be to rip it out, put in some gravel, put in a vapor barrier, pour a new floor. But you're probably going to run into height on your ceiling issues. I would suggest if it was my house and I had a 1913 basement, I would not be putting in tile. I would be putting in a floating floor like a luxury vinyl plank because it will move and heave with the floor and it won't be destroyed and it'll perform really well for you. 
So um, a cheers for the idea of tiling it, but bad call. Not everything can go everywhere. All right. Uh, Mike Corno. <laughs> cheers, Mike. Got to love this brother right now. Eh? Yeah, no kidding. It's cold. It's snowy. If it's not, it's, it's just crazy. All right. Um, good luck on finding frames in Ikea. There's a backup of lease four months. Really? So there's, that's great information. I wasn't aware. I got my kitchen done. No problem. But I'm not surprised that they're having issues. Another issue, right? And one of the other reasons why, you know, kitchens and bathrooms, not a great plan this year. You never know. I mean, if Ikea can't even keep kitchen cabinets in stock, look out, folks. Right? All right. Uh, David's got a question here. He's got a four by four bathroom shower floor. And he can't find the shower pan. Make it from scratch. You can't find a four by four bath shower pan. All right, David, uh, two things. One, go to your local Ferguson, if you're in the States, or Google search this, Wolseley Mechanical, if you're in Canada. They're in every city of more than 50,000 people, coast to coast to coast to coast to coast. If you can't find it there, go to build.com online and just search 4x4 shower pan. They exist. It's standard. It's probably stock. And if they can't get it to you in 24 to 48 hours, I would be shocked. Okay, but you're right. They don't carry that at, at the Home Depot. And this is what I'm saying, guys. You got to think outside the box store. Okay. <sighs> Mike just watched the Murphy bed video <laughs> last night. Well, cheers. You're almost uh, up to date. Would you recommend doing this in an apartment to save some space? Um, yeah, definitely. Right. There's lots of different options. Um, but like we have that Murphy bed. We're actually living in that room right now because we're finishing off the rest of the renovation at the farmhouse. We're almost done. Cheers. And uh, the idea is that's actually going to be our office. And then we'll convert it into a bedroom when we have guests. Right. It makes perfect sense because the room's soundproof. So we'll use that as an office space. And then when we have guests, they can stay there. And we've got that nice, cool uh, bathroom with the, you know, the the, the rustic slab and the, the stone sink right at the bottom of the stairs. So it's perfect for guests. Um, that's why we did it that way. Oh, um, can I just drywall over painted and mudded paneling on a ceiling? That was done by the previous owner. It's in a finished-ish shed building. Yeah, you can, but here's the problem. When you're installing drywall screws, you're going to have the screw long enough to actually find the framing. And in your situation, you aren't sure if there's going to be other things in the way. And you can't really identify the frame the way you'd like to. So I would just pull down the frame, the paneling. Honestly, paneling comes down pretty darn easy. Yank it down, confirm that, hey, your electrical, plumbing, all that kind of stuff is exactly where you want it. It's stapled up. It's out of the way before you go screwing in drywall. You don't want to be that guy that tries to save a little bit of extra work and then ends up putting a screw right through one of those the, the power lines to your lights and everything shorts out. And then you got to pull all your work off to find that wire anyway. That's just not worth it. <clears throat> wow, look at me. Did I just cough right in the mic? My apologies, everybody. My goodness. James Headley is a member. and He's got a question. Where do you recommend buying vinyl flooring and underpad in Toronto? I think there's a Dragona near here. Would my design options be limited due to COVID? Um, James, we have an affiliate, and you can go check out our website, um, Decorner. They have a brand new vinyl plank flooring company and underpad supply chain put together. Uh, guys, this is actually really good, probably mostly for Canadians only right now, just because of what's going on. Shipping things across the border is really tricky. Ah, frustrating, right? But if you're in Toronto, yeah, yeah, go go jump in any one of our videos. Go to our website, homerenovisiondiy.com. Check out Shop With Us affiliate page. Decorner is the name of the company. And if you buy from there, you're actually going to help support our channel a little bit too, which is probably not a bad thing to do once in a while. All right. Mm. Thomas Haynes has got a question. Why not, Thomas? Video question. What am I missing here, Matt? You're going to have to speak English, buddy. What's going on? Tiling machine. I'm looking for the curdy over drywall. However, some of the drywall is painted. Well, the unmodified thin set and curdy adhere to the painted drywall. Yeah. Um, yes. No, not a problem at all. We did that video, right? 
and we went over the drywall with Curdy membrane. Uh, it wasn't painted, but uh, any kind of modern acrylic paint is not going to be an issue. Matt, did we get to that one? Michael Regan has got a super chat here. Holy cow, Michael. That's very generous, buddy. Appreciate it. Cheers. Update on previous super chat. Okay, so you're living in Southern California. Right. Needs to insulate your 2 by 4 rafters, but with exposed trusses below. Spray foam and faced insulation. There's no air gap between the bat. Okay, so if you have a 2 by 4 rafter and you're in Southern California, you actually need all the help you can get. I would not mix spray foam with face insulation in that situation. I would just go straight spray foam, okay? Because the heat that you're going to be dealing with there and trying to separate that from your air conditioning to get a good, comfortable result, don't blend the technology. Um, just go straight spray foam because two by fours are not very thick. But in three and a half inches, you can definitely get past R20 closer to R30 insulation, which is really what you want, more closer to R30. And you can do that with spray foam. You can't do that if you mix it with bat. All right. So cheers. Thanks for getting back to us. Appreciate that. Hey, there's a question there from Ace. Uh, following up on your crawl space question from last week. Because <laughs> I'm going to remember that, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to do my best here, Ace. Um, you're going to heat the crawl space. Good idea. Should I seal the crawl space or create vents into the house? Lots of different options online. No, what you want to do is you want to treat your crawl space like a uh, different part of the house. So you want to have heat and you want to have cold air return at that crawl space. So you're blowing heat in one side and cold air return pulling out the other. So then you have air movement. Okay. Very important. You can't just blow heat into a space, right? Like grab a balloon, blow it up until you can't blow it any anymore because your lungs are going to blow up. That's your crawl space when you put heat into it. There's no air going in there because it's already full of air. And the walls aren't expanding for you to help facilitate that. So you got to have air leaving when you're pushing air in. You got to have air pulling out. So add cold air return, add a heating system just into that crawl space and treat it like its own environment. And you'll be a lot more successful. And yeah, trust me on that one. Um, it's also easier to manage pests. Dealing with mice. If they're separated from the rest of the house and, and they can get into the crawl space, then having traps in the crawl space is a great way to manage them. As soon as you start making holes the rest of the house, they're going to be all over the place real quick and easy. And that's 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 really good advice. All right. Uh, what else we got here, buddy? Linda has a question. Our wood deck is in bad shape. How can I tell if I can save it or not? Okay. Um, here's some great tip. I know this is crazy. We'll get to Will's question in a second. If you have a wooden deck and it's not performing well and it's starting to age a little bit, and it still feels structurally strong, but you don't like the surface. Are you ready for this? Crescent tool sells that red bar. Now, I just did that deck video, and we showed how to pop the, the boards out. And you put that bar in, and you pop your boards out, take out your nails and screws, flip your board over. Now you've got a brand new surface, right? And you can install it right back on the same location, snail it or screw it down again, Okay, and you're right back in business. And you might be surprised how many more years you can get out of that deck if you just flip the board over. Yeah, I know. <sighs> Mind blown. But when you put in a deck board, you've got two surfaces to work with. So when you've exhausted the first one or you've got so much paint and crap, you don't want to have to sand it all off, flip the board over. And if you want to know what, what kind of condition it's in, I'm going to tell you right now. If it's not rotting so you're not falling through, you can still flip it over and use it. 95 times out of 95, six, maybe 96. All right, it's not very often that a board will rot from the underside unless it's really close to the ground and you get a sauna effect. Most people are installing decks not at the ground level. You can flip them right over and it should work out just great for you. And if you have the ability to inspect it first and you can confirm it before you go buy the tool or, or, or plan to do all that work, you can get on there with a flashlight and you just be like, oh my God. I never even thought that the underside would look like it's still sitting on the shelf at Home Depot because usually that's exactly what it looks like. It's perfectly preserved and it's ready to just be flipped over and used. Cheers. Will, got a question here, bud. Any tips on how to best deal with fire blocks and fishing when replacing old aluminum wire with copper? Yeah, my wire runs all the way from the attic down to the first floor in a two-story built in 1974, but you got fire blocking. Okay. Uh, yeah, here's how we deal with fire blocking. 
Um, I'm not sure where you're going to find this. If you go to a electrical supply store, all right, Google this electrical supply store. They actually sell drill bits. Are you ready for this? It's a spade bit that's four feet long. All right, it's flexible. And you put it in your drill, and you can actually drill the hole through the fire blocking from the attic. I know that's going to just blow your mind right there. Um, worst case scenario, use a stud finder to identify the blocking, right? And then you can make a small square hole with the rota zip and the drywall. And then you can drill a hole, fish your wire, and then just do a California patch. Sometimes when you're rewiring a house, you got no option but to cut access points. Okay. So always cut them rectangular or square. So you can do a California patch. Don't make them bigger than four or five inches by five inches. And you don't even need to add support. Okay. You should be fine with that. Um, if you want extra support behind a, a California patch and it's in a weird spot and you can't get framing and all that kind of jazz, just grab, grab an old newspaper, crumple it up and shove it in the hole. All right. And so, so it's sticking out of the hole. And then when you put your patch on, good to go. Okay. You can fill it up with mud and stick it all in there. You'll be cool. But yeah, um, if you got fire blocking issues, cut a hole right where the fire block is. Use a stud finder, identify it. All right. And if you're lucky, they put the blocking high enough that you can actually just drill at it right from the attic. That's uh, that's really handy. All right. Um, it's also a lazy man's way to drill holes in the floor plate so you don't have to get down on your hands and knees. It's a great tool. <laughs> I'm going to have to show that one of these days in a video, Matt. All right. Uh, that Sandy Rose lady is so nice. You should consider sending her one of those blue shirts. <laughs> yeah, right? What a great idea. All right, um, Michelle, I know you're watching. Let's uh, make a note of that. That might be fun. We should maybe do a giveaway once in a while. All right. Yeah, oh, look at that. Michelle's right ahead of me. She's always like, PM me your size. I'm putting in another order soon. So if anybody wants one and you want to let us know, I don't know. They're not that expensive. We could probably work something out. Um, okay. <laughs> Way to go, Sandy. Yeah, all right. What do we got here? Uh, Joe has got a question. When I remove drywall going down the stairway to the basement, the sound has become much quieter. We like it. No more echo. Oh, okay. Is there any way to reproduce this dead sound when I re-drywall? Perhaps paint. No. The only way that you can um, get rid of the echo from drywall is put in soundproofing insulation in the walls. Okay. And I would even suggest use 5 8 drywall. A, because staircases are usually a fire exit and it's nice to make sure that that wall is going to last longer than a fire. <laughs> um, but B, it has so much fiberglass in it, all of the sound hits and, the, and it changes direction every fiber it hits. And so it really mutes the sound. That's why all boardrooms in North America are made out of 5 8 drywall, fire rated and not half inch because it's really effective at reducing the sound. And you'll find that it's as easy as putting in 5 8 drywall and maybe a little fiberglass pink in the walls and you'll be fine. All right. Um, next question. I can't get my measurements right for crown molding and baseboards. Hmm. Okay. I don't think that's a measure a question as much as a comment. What do you think, Matt? You have I have tips. Watch my videos on finished carpentry. And uh, make caulking your best friend. You know, sometimes that's just what it's all about. Um, yeah, should I put off building a deck this year? Perhaps. I'm just going to say it, guys. Perhaps. There's a chance that everybody who wants to build a deck built it last year. I, you know, I just don't know. But there's a really good chance that just as many people who built a deck last year want to build it this year and are jealous of everybody who got a deck last year and want their own. And so we are in a world of hurt and we might run out of wood. Um, so, hey, Merp, welcome to Money in the Bank. Cheers to being a member. Um, how do I attach things? Lights, awning, wood, et cetera, to stucco exterior homes. Uh, dumbass stucco screws are trash and don't work. Yeah, tell me about it. Man, that is tough. 
you know, because it's really difficult to understand where your, your framework is in that house, right? And you don't want to be f attaching things to just the sheathing of the house. It's not really good enough. I would suggest that you use a masonry bit to drill a hole and then drill through the sheathing if you have it there and then use a toggle bolt. It's the kind that has a long bolt and this like wings that fold and you can stick it in. And when it gets into the hole, <clears throat> it pops open and it never comes back out. Then you tighten the screw. That toggle bolt might just be the answer to your question. And um, yeah, that's, that's maddening. Okay, Mike, hopefully we can get me a ticket to the farmhouse post pandemic. I uh, hope you're all healthy and well. Can't wait to catch up. You know what I was thinking? I mean, maybe I shouldn't be announcing this without asking my wife. Sorry, Michelle, for saying this, but I'm thinking when the house is all done, you know, we should have a post-pandemic little get-together for our members. Everybody can come to Ottawa and sleep on my side yard, tent out or something. I don't know. <laughs> we'll wait and see. We, we won't be able to do something like that until we can't get arrested for having more than 10 people at my house. But yeah, uh, big ass barbecue and, and it would be a lot of fun. All right. Um, bum, 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 bum. It is 12 minutes to eight running out of time, guys. If you got questions, hit me now. Jax wants to know what kind of paint for the bathroom with a shower, latex or oil on the ceiling. Well, <clears throat> latex is going to be the way I need to go. My friend just got to use hundred percent acrylic. All right. Um, I actually have an incredible paint video that we just released on Saturday. Didn't we? If you want to know about painting and you want to know about materials and selections and which one to use where and what, and, and some really great tips for getting a fantastic finish, then you got to check out my latest painting video. Um, I think I called it something like, uh, um, how professional painters cut corners or something like that. Make sure you watch that. It wasn't just a, a tongue in cheek. It was actually a tutorial. It was really good information. I'm, I'm really proud of that video. Uh, okay. I need to do a video on how to build a trailer camper. <laughs> right? That would be fun. I, uh, you wouldn't believe what goes through my brain when I, <laughs> I wake up at four o'clock in the morning and I'm just like, what a great idea for a video. Ah, what a great idea. I can't do it all at once. So this year we're going to try to focus on uh, a major focus is going to be just making sure that um, we give you guys all the information that you're going to need to be successful with a pandemic year. Cause there's going to be a lot of things going on. A lot of things changing. We're going to give you options. We're going to look at techniques and tips and, and different assemblies that we haven't talked about yet that can be really beneficial. Uh, at what, 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 uh, 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 uh. There's a question here somewhere. Do I have a full series on siding? Yeah, and we put it all into one video. <laughs> Instead of doing 15 five-minute videos, we put it all into one great big one. So feel free. Jump on our website or our, our YouTube homepage. Just put in the search engine siding, and it's right there. Um, and that'll work out great for you. And we did one extra video with a little tool that shows you how to open it up, what your existing siding is. Um, yeah, I got a video for a lot of things. Not everything. We got, we got lots of work to do yet. Cut corners like a pro video. That's the one. That's the paint video, right? Because every professional painter knows how to cut corners. And if you get it, yeah, I'm kind of making fun of the industry just a little bit. But at the same time, it's true. Good painter knows how to cut a decent corner. All right. Uh, right. Converting a minibus into a van. Now I'll let somebody else do that. I don't want to live in a bus. Is there anything you shouldn't put painter's tape on? Yeah, paint. Don't ever put painter's tape on any painted surface. It makes a hell of a mess. Uh, no amount of money can pay for the knowledge you provided. Well, <laughs> let's all try. All right. A million thanks for all the helpful videos. Couldn't have done my renovation project without you. Very cool. All right. So call Mickey. I uh, appreciate that super chat, dude. Um, and you know what? Happy to help. Um, listen, this is the year, right? Like, remember what I said? There's nobody out there who is even talking about any of you because you're homeowners, right? You're not big investors. You're not, you're not flippers. You don't own 20 doors. No one gives a rip. You're going to do what you're told. That's how the industry works, Right. Home Depot sold $160 billion last year, four times the gross income of the NBA because they tell you what to do. 
get it through your head. They're not your friend. Nobody cares. There's never a news cycle about what homeowners should think about doing for renovations this year. No one cares. No one cares about you. 300 million people, you all are going to do renovations and no one even gives a rip because they think they've got you all figured out. They got you put in a box and they've already told you exactly what you should expect and how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it and what you're going to pay for it. All right. They don't give a rip. I care. I want you to have a successful renovation. So help us out. All right. Be there. We're going to give you tons of information. I'm filming a video with Max tomorrow, and I'm going to show you how to research online to find all these other stores and all these other options where you can get better products, more options, better pricing, better everything, better experience, and no orange apron. God help us with the orange apron. What's the point of the apron? They don't even have a pen on them. I mean, come on. All right. I got some stuff here, Matt. Bring me up to speed. Where am I? What? Okay, so Ben has a comment here. You're as funny as a rubber crutch and a leg <laughs> I, I'm I'm going to need time to absorb that. Um, Rob Johnson just joined the the Money in the Bank. Cheers, Rob. Welcome to the program, buddy. Um, Thomas is super chatted here. Worth every penny. You helped me build some awesome built-in bookshelves, desk area with your closet remodel videos. Yeah, right. See, you didn't even make a closet, and you managed to use that information and be creative. That is awesome. I'm very proud of you, man. That's the kind of stuff I want to see. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. One of these days, one of these days. How many subs does it take, Matt, before the people in this world will actually pay attention to our voice? What do you think? Depends what kind of people you're talking to. Well, you know what? Like, I'm going to just do this right now. If you are important in any of the companies that I use on my show on a regular basis, it's because I like your stuff. So contact us and get my viewers a deal. Huh? Man, I mean, what do I got to do? Like rent a plane, have it flying around major cities with a banner on it? Support home de renovation DIY or else? Like, come on. Get militant. All right. Um, <laughs> we got another super chat. Apparently, I look like a green pear and I tap dance. <laughs> That's awesome. You want a deal? Ah, oh, you can't handle a deal. Yeah, I'm telling you right now. Listen, we are trying our best to negotiate with for um, get my corporate pricing into your hands. All right. Yeah, I don't even need to get paid. I don't care. If if I make all these things available to members, my business model is going to take care of itself. All right. I just want to make sure that when you go out and buy a gallon of paint, you don't buy a bucket of white water, right? For 20 bucks at Home Depot, because it looks like a good deal. And you come home and you paint your wall and it, and it looks like something's melting, right? It's garbage. Don't buy that crap. If you buy paint and you're at a box store, do me a favor, slap yourself and leave. Go find a real paint store. Okay. They way overcharged for the stuff over there. It's unbelievable. You're darn right I saved you a lot of money. If I can teach you how to do 10% of the projects in your house, right? And it, it, it's going to pay for this membership program 10 times a year. All right, guys, listen, it's uh, almost 8 o'clock. I'm really starting to get ready for a refill, but I got to drive home first, so I can't. <sighs> I got to be responsible. <sighs> Walk in with a blue shirt and look official. <laughs> Scott, that's a great idea. Great idea, Right? But we should just get blue shirts for all of our members so they can all walk around and say, yeah, I'm with Home Renovation. Give me my deal. Kristen wants a Fest Tool discount, right? That's amazing. Listen, um, I want to get you a door and window discount. I want to get you a siding discount. I want to get you uh, I want to get you a paint discount. If there is a product on the market that I can get a commercial discount on, I want to pass it on to you. But it takes a little bit of finesse and some dancing around. And, you know, so um, as soon as everybody realizes that uh, this is a good idea to move all the purchasing power that you guys have from Home Depot and Lowe's into their store, that's when, when, that, when that light bulb goes off, then we'll get the deals. Until then, it's blood, sweat, and tears. We're kicking down doors. We're trying our best. We're screaming and yelling from the top of our little mountain. And I'm preaching from my little curb here. But, uh, you know, one of these days it'll happen sooner or later. We just got to make sure that if you watch this channel, you subscribe to it. Like, how hard is that? 
All you men I'm talking to you out there that don't subscribe, it takes seconds to fill in the information and have an account. Push the subscribe button, join the DIY nation, and help give us the power to go kick in those doors and take over the world for you. That's all I'm saying. Help me help you. Help me help you. Little Jerry Maguire moment there. All right. I think we're good. What? Hit the like button if you haven't. Hey, cheers. There's Paul Peck in the chat again. Um, ba -bum 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 -bum. Isn't Bear rated as a better paint? No, it's a scam. Anybody, and I'm going to tell you this for free because we're doing a video soon. Anybody that's selling a paint and primer in the same can is selling a can of crap because it doesn't exist. Yep, there's the precursor to the video. It's a marketing ploy. Okay? It's crap. It's way too thick. You can't possibly get good coverage with that paint. It takes two gallons to paint even the smallest room, even if you're not doing the closet. What a waste of money. If you're buying paint, you want three things. You want great coverage. You want great application so it's not spraying all over the place, right? And you don't want to get stoned when you're using it. You can't get that at Home Depot. I'm telling you right now. None of those three you can get there. You know, they sell you what they sell you because that's where they make their most money. There's a reason there's no such thing as a bear store anywhere else on the planet. No one else would buy that crap if it wasn't inside that box. Not a self-respecting painter in the world says, ooh, I use bear paint because it's the best. No, none of them. You won't even find one. As a matter of fact, here's a paint challenge. If there's a painter out there and you use bear paint specifically because of how awesome it is, <laughs> put that in the comment. All right? Anytime in the next two months, and I'll give you a blue shirt for free. Because he doesn't exist. It's a guarantee. If you want good paint, go to a store that doesn't have an orange or a blue sign. They have good paint. I don't even, I don't have to, it's not about, it's not about the paint. It's about, if it's in that store, chances are it's crap. Box stores don't sell good product. They sell you what you think is a good product and they sell you what makes them the most money and that's it. Okay. I use bear paint exclusively. And what paint company are you running? None. I'll tell you right now. I love Home Depot because it's convenient. It has building materials. It has plumbing fixtures and electrical supplies. It has tools and equipment that I knew, use on a regular basis, right? I buy drywall there because it's one of the cheapest places to get drywall in the market. But you will not find me buying flooring or paint or tile or just about any other fixture in that store. Won't happen. Ever. Okay? Because I appreciate quality and value. All right. Anyway, I'm not going to get on my soapbox. Yeah, if you want good paint, go to Sherwin-Williams. And then don't buy the cheapest stuff on the floor there. Because they buy cheap, they sell cheap paint too. But they have great paint. So buy the nice stuff. And then you're going to be like, oh, it's so expensive. And then I'm going to be like, that's why I got to get you my commercial deal. So you get the same price as a gallon of crappy bear paint. All right. Now that's just my opinion. All right. So uh, don't hit me with a slander lawsuit or anything. I'm just telling you. I've used it once and I was disgusted and I've never touched it again. And that was 35 years ago. Yeah, I was probably 16. No, maybe not that long ago. 20 years ago. I was 21. I hated it. It was the nastiest stuff on the planet. All right. You know, they don't even sell proper plumbing there. Even the ABS pipes aren't actually ABS. It's just black pipe with the word ABS on it. It actually isn't ABS. It's not as, it's, it's, it's like a fake. It's like, it's like particle board doors instead of wood doors, but it's still a door. It's really bizarre how they get away with all this stuff. All right. It's eight o'clock. I'm out of here. I'm done. This is enough for me. I'll be again here next week. Next week, same bad time, same bad channel. Tomorrow night, we're going to put out another video. Make sure you watch it. Okay. It's going to change lives. When you guys like our videos and you, and you hit the thumbs up and you comment and you share, YouTube goes, oh, this is really good information. We're going to share it with more people. And then we can help change their life too. So appreciate you all being a part of the DIY Nation. It's not just a YouTube channel. It's a movement. <laughs> all right. I'm out. Um, thanks a lot for coming by, everybody. 
Appreciate all your help. Sandy, pleasure seeing you again as always. Uh, Mary, Shay, how come How come it's always the women who are running the chat? I just think it's awesome. You know, our, our we got 85% of our subscribers are men and 50% of our chat people are, are women. I think that is really cool. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Without you, we wouldn't have many to talk to. <laughs> it's awesome. Cheers, Michelle, for uh, being in the chat back home. Uh, it's past lockdown. Yeah, really? Yeah, we have curfews to drive around. So now i got to drive home with my lights off and try not to get caught by the police. That's awesome. <laughs> I don't think it's quite that bad, but I, I am at work and I'm allowed to have a job. So this is okay. All right. Jeff is out. We'll see you uh, next week in the live show, six o'clock Tuesday night, just like always. And we're going to keep doing this as long as I can do it. Definitely till the end of February and maybe even longer. Who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Dukes of Hazard style. Yeah. God, I could just sit here and watch these comments all day long. You guys are freaking hilarious. I love it. All right. Cheers to all of you. And with that, adieu. <laughs>